بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته عليكم السلام ورحمة الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله um, I was thinking that Alhamdulillah our oral tradition and especially in the Shia school of thought tends to to be the one that preserved our heritage that we've inherited from the Imams yet I think it's also in an attempt to do something a little different I was thinking that perhaps you guys can help me as um, to in uh, one part of what I wanted to present today so reflections are something I, I'm confident to share, but in telling a story of a companion, I'm afraid that I may not do them justice. So inshallah, throughout my few reminders and trying to review all these stories that we listen to year after year, and we all know most of the details of these stories. So let us just kind of take an approach of reviewing the story of the Ansar that I'd like to um, talk about today. Um, so. I'd like to first start by um, quoting uh, Rumi in, um, in a discussion that I believe he was inspired to uh, talk about from Hajj. And since that we've just um, left the Hajjah, I felt that um, quoting this um, discussion would be something nice to share. So, by God, we must always have hope. Faith itself consists of fear and hope. Someone asked me, hope itself is good, but what is this fear? And I said, show me a fear without a hope, or a hope without a fear. The two are inseparable. So before I go on uh, and sharing my own reflections of this, uh, I'd like to ask, especially my fellow Hajis who have just returned, what does the idea of hope and fear remind you of? It was, it was our sa'i between Safa and, and Marwa. And today, I wanted to talk about, when I read this, um, I was actually trying to make these connections last minute, to be, tr to be honest. And it hit me that the, sahab, the Ansar and the Sahaba of Imam Hussein that I'd like to speak about is someone that went through his own sa'i, between his fears and his hopes, through different transitions and his realization of where the truth is. And that Ansar had it, it was, he was the most one that I could relate to because when I was trying to see which Ansar I should choose and I was going through all the uh, Ansars that the other brothers listed in them and spoke about, they were so great that I, I couldn't even think that how can I relate to, some, to these people. But, so I wanted someone who experienced a, a change, someone who experienced a simple moment of truth and, and, and decided to act upon it. Um, and for that purpose, um, I chose this person who, between his struggle and fear of hope, he fulfilled the role that his name, that his mother has uh, given him, with the name that his mother has given him, of being, I suppose that some of you can guess, Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Ali Muhammad. So inshallah we can uh, remember the, some aspects of the story of al hur and how he um, helped uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam and then try to hopefully try to apply them to our own um, little struggles within the short time that I have. <laughs> so um, when, when we look at the story of um, Hur, it's interesting to see that he was, how many of you, what, 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 can I move this in my hand? Or? No? Okay. Yeah, I feel more comfortable this way. Okay, so um, when we look at him, so do any of you remember how many, first of all, who was the leader who sent Hur after the group of uh, Imam Hussein, after the caravan? Do you remember the name of that? Who was? It was Abaydullah bin Ziyad. And um, how many soldiers were with him? Do you remember how many soldiers were sent, or what are the most narrations? So what do most narrations say? One thousand. One thousand. Yeah. So um, 
See, by doing this, you guys are also taking the responsibility of the truth of the quotations of, of this. Um, so there were a thousand soldiers that were sent with this person, with Al-Hur, and Al-Hur himself was one of the Shurafa. He was known, and by Shurafa it means he was one of uh, very highly respected leaders of his community. And this was um, a character that he had from before, from a Jahiliya and uh, from before the age of ignorance and from uh, after Islam. He remained uh, to be among the Shurafa and the leaders um, of um, his community. Um, and was known for his bravery. So when he was sent um, to, he was ordered first to um, um, stop the caravan of Imam uh, Hussein from getting to Kufa. And uh, upon the arrival, there were, when I, when I was trying to think about, just to get back um, before that, when I was trying to think about him, I thought of him as someone who took the chance to change from being on the extreme end of, uh, of jur, of lulum, of injustice, to go to the extreme end of justice. And I was thinking, how can we, we as, uh, as far as we are from those kind of people, be able to relate to someone that went from the two polar opposites? Because for us, it's always good to take an approach of step by step and changing whatever we need to change, uh, given our capabilities. But then when I started examining his journey and how he met Imam Hussein and um, and what happened throughout the journey, I realized that it wasn't just going from one extreme end to the other. It was a gradual one through the contemplations that he went through, through little instances that happened with him in his interaction with Imam Hussein. And this truly tells us a lot about how we need to interact with others, whether it is that we need to change them, or whether it is that we just need to show them our faith and show them who we are and what our, our identity is. So um, in the first moment of interaction that happened between um, Imam Hussein and um, and Hur. Um, first of all, the Ansar, the Ansar from Hussein, they, 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 one of them thought he saw uh, uh, Nakhil, he thought he saw palm trees from a distance, and uh, eventually they realized it was actually the soldiers of Al Hur and him coming towards them. So it wasn't really the khair that they had first anticipated, it was e evil, or what looked like evil that was coming towards them. So when they came, Imam Hussein obviously having good Ilm al he knows what they're coming for, but um, he still welcomed them. And he, uh, does anyone know what Imam Hussein did to their horses and to them? He gave them water. He gave them water, so, and uh, ironically, they were ordered later to prevent him from water. So I think there is a message in that for Imam Hussein to, you know, give even when you know that this will be taken from you. And give the one thing that will be taken from you and be proactive about it. So he, he quenched their thirst and he gave them water and then when Salah time came, what, does anyone know what happened? When Salah time came, when Dhuhr time came? They all prayed together. And that one instance, when I was thinking about it, I was like, wow, Imam Hussein did not just simply leave them to pray and he did not just simply pray on his own. What he did, he actually gave them the option. He told them, um, do you, he, he told Al-Hur, do you want to pray with your people? And by doing that, there was a great reminder for Al-Hur that do you want to separate from us or do you want to have that? that Imam Hussein did not even tell, come and join us, but he said, do you want to pray with your people? And he gave them that freedom. And that also shows us that even when we disagree with people, we need to give them that option to disagree with us. So he offered him that option. And Al-Hur said, no, we will pray with you. And that in itself is a is admission that he is surrendering to the right path. But and that for me, I felt like that was the first gradual reminder for him that what am I what am I doing? Had he been stubborn or had he been truly convinced of what he was doing, then he would have prayed in a different um, group. But he chose to follow the salah of Imam Hussein. Salah Muhammad wa Muhammad. And, um, and, and that was the first uh, moment of, um, I feel that that was the first moment that could have even sparked his, that idea of what am I doing? And to start thinking um, to his, and within himself. So after that prayer, um, a, another instance happened, which is a discussion of, you know, why are you coming? And uh, I have been ordered not to let you pass. And we see that even in his following of the orders, um, 
he was kind of following a pattern of this is what I've been ordered, this is what I promised I would do, and I'm doing it. He did not, although he knew how sensitive the situation was, he did not take, or what I, what I see is that he did not take the stand of, um, you know, I will attack them by himself. And he wouldn't have been penalized for that, but um, he, he still went with whatever was agreed on as minimum as possible, the way that um, I, I feel it, it went. Um, so when the discussion happened, and Al-Hur said, uh, Shum, we have not, and Imam Hussain said, I am responding to your books. I have been called by uh, the people of Kufa. And Al-Hur said, uh, Wallahi, I do not know about this. And uh, what books are you speaking of? And when he was presented with these, he did take a look at them. And I feel that that was a moment where we are, we are to learn that we have to present our hajjah to the people that we know are not doing the right thing. And we have to present our proof. Imam Hussein does not need to show these letters, but he did went to the effort of asking his companions, bring all these letters, let us show them to, um, um, to this, um, to Al-Hur. So this hujjah in itself, I feel, added on the salah and added on what, um, that moment of contemplation that later on ma made Al-Hur decide to join Imam Hussein's uh, caravan. Um, so, I also found a hadith that I'm not sure how um, credible its uh, narration is, but it was interesting to see that Al-Hur himself later tells the Imam before um, he passes away that when I was leaving the, the castle of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad right after being ordered to come um, after you, um, I, was, I heard a voice telling me um, something along the line in Arabic, Abshar khayran al-Hur, which means that goodness are, is coming your way. And he looked around and he wanted to see who's telling him and what kind of goodness could come from what he's going after. And that also, that kind of intuition shows that there was a voice, whether it was a voice within him or whether it was a sign, because after all, like I started, it is only the, those who Allah wishes to guide that are guided. So that sense of intuition was also a reminder for him to question himself. So finally, and... Um, I, I'm running out of time, <laughs> so I'm going, to, I'm going to jump into the last uh, few points that um, I was going to do. I'd like us to um, take a time, when, when he decided, when he started deciding that he did want to um, change his mind, that some of the narrations say that he discussed it with his son, and, he, and his slave heard, and he said, oh, take me with you. And that in itself also shows the kind of akhlaq that he had in terms of the equality that some of the uh, previous speakers were talking about, that when he ma made that decision, despite his high status, he and his son and his slave went all together and they joined the caravan of Imam Hussein. Um, and when, they were, when he was asked, we all know the famous um, uh, quote that he says when he was asked about where are you going, what did he say, if I had to choose between heaven and hell, then I, I swear I will not choose other than heaven. And, uh, and, and that shows that he now <coughs> knew where his true fear and hope was. They went from being hopeful to have the rida of the Sultan of, of his time, or the rida of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, to realizing that my hope has to be to attain the rida of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to attain Jannah. And that, um, that's, that should be my hope, and that my fear should be that I should not be on the wrong track. So there was a reversal, and that reversal only happened after he took the time to go through some contemplation, after he took the time to listen what the other person offered in terms of the hajjah that Imam Hussein did, and um, after he took the time to um, truly follow that feeling within him. So for us, I, I'd like to ask everyone to tonight after we, we go home and we think about everything that was spoken about is let us identify our, our hopes and fears and let us identify our goals because these goals are the ones who determ that determine what these hopes and fears are and let us try to, to maybe change them and take a one step at a time to reverse our hopes and fears if we do know that they are on the wrong track because if you really want to know um, my last quote for Rumi is that things are made clear by their opposites. So if you really want to know what your fears and hopes, also look for things that are opposite of what 
you know deep down what your fears are and look for their opposite and start examining because we need to learn how to question tradition and how to um, question ourselves. And within the, once questioning begins, then um, we can truly be able to define and redefine and continually grow to know ourselves and know our needs and know how to get to Hasn al-Aqibah, inshallah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.